Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second episode where I will be covering some basics on how to get started using Python and Pulp for optimization. If you are new to this channel and mathematical optimization and haven't yet seen the first episode on the fundamentals, please check it out by clicking on the link in the video. Also, don't forget to subscribe by clicking below. Now let's get started. Today's episode has five parts. To start, I will show viewers where to go to get their Anaconda distribution. After that, I will do a walkthrough in parts two and three on launching Jupyter Lab, navigating the interface, and installing the Pulp library. In part four, I will solve the example problem from episode one in Jupyter Lab notebook. Finally, I will conclude with a preview of what you can expect for the episode three series. One disclaimer up front is I won't be giving a detailed introduction on programming in general. Since there are a lot of really good and free resources out there to get started with Python, go ahead and check those out. Today, I will, however, cover some things I feel are important as they relate to optimization. All right, so to get started today, uh, let's go ahead and get Anaconda distribution installed on your computer. If you click on the link in the description for Anaconda, it'll take you to this web page, which is the download uh, page for the Anaconda individual edition. To do that, just go ahead and click on this little download button here on the right. Once the download is complete, you can run the installer, follow the prompts, and use the default recommendations to get that completed. Um, there's a bunch of information on exactly what the Anaconda distribution is on their webpage, so I recommend you read it if there's interest. But essentially, it's a really easy way to get started and a really great way for beginners to manage their uh, you know, libraries and packages in Python. Uh, makes all of that really easy. So that's why I recommend folks start with this if they're new to programming in Python. There's certainly other ways to get a Python interpreter and development environment on your computer, um, but this one's really easy for beginners. So once that installation is complete, uh, we can actually go ahead and launch Jupyter Lab, which as I've mentioned before, will be our primary development environment for this channel. And there's two ways to go about doing that. So the first way, is once Anaconda is complete, you can um, search for Anaconda in your programs or apps, and let's spell that. And you'll see a bunch of options pop up. There's one option that says Anaconda Navigator, and it's got a little green circle around that. If you click that, it'll actually bring up a uh, user interface, and the Anaconda Navigator looks a lot looks like this when it pops up. So there's uh, a few things over here on the left. There's a tab for environments and learning and community, which you can explore uh, later on your own. Uh, but the home page essentially has what we need to get going, which is uh, all of your development environments that you can go ahead and use to start programming. Uh, below the ones that come with the download, you'll see the word launch, it means it's installed and ready to go. Uh, if you see the word install, um, it's not included right now, but you can go ahead and install it if you'd like by clicking the install button. For us, Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Notebook should come with the download, so you should be good to go when you get this open and you can go ahead and click launch. Uh, just a small point to make Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Notebook are very similar uh, in terms of appearance and behavior, but uh, slight preference for me in terms of Jupyter Lab, the user interface. So that's what I like to use. So you can launch it again from the Anaconda Navigator. Uh, the other way to, to launch it is you can go ahead, come down here. You can type in uh, Anaconda. Sorry, I'm going to do it on my other screen here. You can type in Anaconda prompt. You click on that, and it will actually load a prompt that pops up, and it looks like this. So again, to do that, you just type in Anaconda. You click on the prompt, it'll bring up this app. And then you can just type in Jupyter, all lowercase, two words, hit enter. It's the way I tend to launch it because it's a little bit faster. The Anaconda Navigator can take a, a minute or so to load. Um, and it's a little buggy sometimes. So I find this to be much easier. So this is what the, uh, the Jupyter Lab interface looks like. Um, before I jump into the uh, actual problem, example problem for today, I just want to go over a few navigation items on the actual interface and then also a few uh, navigation items uh, within a Jupyter Notebook. So typically when you launch this, it'll be uh, empty, especially if it's your first time and you'll have this little launcher tab. 
Launcher tab is a, sort of a quick way to get started. Uh, you can click on uh, the notebook and it will launch a, a new notebook with a Python 3 kernel ready to go like that. Um, you discard this. You can launch console, terminal, text file, markdown file, etc. cetera. Um, but anyways, this is what it looks like. Over here on the left, there's some options. Um, this folder option is essentially turns this left pane into a file navigation or file directory um, view, which is helpful. So you can navigate your folders and find your various uh, data files or find your various Jupyter Notebook files. Uh, Jupyter Notebook files are uh, indicated here. They see a little orange, orange color on the left of a Jupyter Notebook file and the extensions are I, P, Y, and B. Uh, so you can open files from here, delete files from here, move files around here, etc. cetera. So um, that is a file navigation. To start a new notebook, I mentioned you could do it here from the launcher, or you can come up here and hit file new, and then you can select notebook. Uh, when you open a new notebook like this, it'll ask you what kernel, for all intents and purposes, just pick the latest Python kernel and hit select, and you'll get a new notebook. Uh, so that's basics of the navigation pane. Um, I do want to cover installing pulp, uh, part three of today's uh, episode. So in order to, to install a new package or a new library uh, from the JupyterLab interface, uh, you can do this through a terminal window. So when you download Anaconda, you're going to get a bunch of, you know, really popular, common sort of default libraries and packages. Uh, but pulp is not typically included with that. So you're going to have to install the pulp library uh, yourself. And in order to do that, again, you can launch a terminal window through here, or you can launch a terminal window through here. Doesn't matter. So when that terminal window comes up, you'll see a, a prompt just like our Anaconda prompt was. And what you want to type in here is to pip, P I P. It's kind of hard to see because of the color. Install. And then you'll type in pulp or the name or the name of the library. Again, this is how you'll install any library. So pip install and then the name of the library. Um, there's a whole bunch of YouTube and resource videos around you know the different commands, especially around you know pip if you're doing sort of a more detailed install and there's certain features or functionalities or options you want to include. But just to get the library as is pip install library name will work. So I'm going to run this. It's going to say that it's already installed. For others, it will uh, go through a number of different steps and get the library installed. But once that's complete uh, and, and you have no issues and it says that uh, it's all been installed and it's finished, you can just type an exit here and it will close the terminal window. So that's how you install Pulp and really any other library from the Jupyter Lab interface. Um, now talk a little bit about navigation with the Jupyter Notebooks. So if you have, you know, multiple notebooks, they appear up here as tabs, so you can kind of cycle between them. Um, I've got a bunch of new notebooks here. You can see Untitled, Untitled 1, Untitled 2. Uh, this is what it looks like when you create a new notebook. And I just want to go over a few things on these notebooks before I jump to the problem for today. So, uh, these notebooks are basically a collection of cells. So e each of these cells here, you know, you could start writing code in there. Um, so, you know, x equals, let's just say pi. And then if you, you know, want to code in here, you can do this and it will run. So this is a code cell. You can automatically create a new cell below the one you wrote by running, running it and by hitting shift enter. So that'll run this cell and create a new one subsequently. The other way to create cells or add cells is to Hit this plus sign, it'll add a cell where, wherever you're at in your notebook, it'll add a cell immediately after. So that's one way to do it. Another way, uh, if you don't want to delete a cell, you just select it, hit D twice. So that's how you delete and add a cell. To run a cell, I already mentioned you can hit Shift Enter or you can hit this play. Um, if you need to restart your kernel, you click this little restart here. It's kind of like uh, just refreshing or restarting the notebook if your you know, code's hung up or you're looping infinitely or you need to break it. If you want to restart and run your entire notebook from beginning to end, you hit this double arrow here. Um, and this last thing, this is the last thing I want to talk about and uh, also why I want to, I like using Jupyter Lab. So when you create a cell, it assumes you're, writing, you're creating a new uh, cell for a new block of code. 
So uh, when you create this, it comes out as code. But let's say that you want to add some context or some information, maybe even some images uh, for your notebook that are going to help folks follow along a problem like you'll see in my notebook here in a little bit. Uh, you can change the cell type to markdown. You can also change it to raw, but I never use that. I've only ever used markdown. And when you change it to markdown, it comes now, it, it's sort of like a, a mini Word document or Word space. You can actually do formatting in here. You could, you know, make bullets of information. You can do a bunch of stuff. So, for example, if I just wanted to make a generic header, I could do hashtag space header. You see that sort of blue text there. Um, and then I can just start writing, you know, text information or, you know, reader, coder, whoever's sort of looking at this, or even just for your own, you know, purposes of documenting your thoughts. And then when you run this cell, you can see that it pops out into a sort of a nice formatted, readable um, appearance. So I like to use JupyterLab because of this feature alone, because I like to write code, and then I like to sort of add a lot of information or context within there. And it's also great for what I'll be doing on this channel, which is sort of teaching how to solve certain problem, problems or teaching certain topics. Um, it's a great way to set up a lesson uh, without having to always be, you know, within PowerPoint. So that's the basics of navigating uh, a specific cell, or sorry, a specific notebook. We are now ready to solve our first problem in Python uh, using a Jupyter notebook and our bulk library. So before we jump into the actual code and how to build a linear program and mathematical model using Python and Pulp, I'm going to go back over uh, the problem description, opportunity statement, and problem definition for this example problem, which was covered in episode one. So we'll start off here. Uh, the RMC Incorporated is a small firm that produces a variety of chemical products. In a particular production process, three raw materials are blended or mixed together to produce two products, a fuel additive and a solvent base. Each ton of fuel additive is a mixture of 0.4 tons of material one and 0.6 tons of material two. A ton of solvent base is a mixture of 0.5 tons of material one, 0.2 tons of material two, and 0.3 tons of material three. After deducting relevant costs, the profit contribution is $40 for every ton of fuel additive produced and $30 for every ton of solvent base produced. RMC's production is constrained by a limited availability of these three materials. Uh, the opportunity statement after the reading that problem description could be summarized as, uh, we want to maximize profit by determining how much of each product, solvent base and fuel additive, to produce with the raw materials available. And for our problem definition, because this is a, a fairly simple example, it's mostly a restatement of the facts, um, but here we can really list out some of the more important details that go into building the model. So the first is that we know that solvent base generates a profit of $30 per ton and fuel additive generates a profit of $40 per ton. We know that one, sol one ton of solvent base requires 0.5 tons of material one, 0.2 tons of material two, and 0.3 tons of material three. We know that one ton of fuel additive requires 0.4 tons of material one and 0.6 tons of material three. We know that profits are going to be maximized for a single period. We're not considering any multi-period sales. We know that our raw material availability is limited to 20 tons of material one, five tons of material two, and 21 tons of material three. And we also know that additional material is not available for purchase. So with that, we can move on to putting together the mathematical model. So we'll start here by actually defining all of our parameters and our inputs and our uh, variables that we're gonna use in our model. So we'll start off by uh, stating that F, lowercase f is gonna stand for fuel additive. Lowercase s is going to stand for solvent base. Lower cases M1, M2, and M3 are going to re, uh, stand for material one, material two, and material three. We're going to declare a set I, which is going to be equal to the products we're making, which in this case is S and F. We're going to declare a set J, which is going to represent the uh, list of materials or raw materials available for producing our products in set I, which are M1, M2, and M3. We're going to uh, declare a new variable P sub i, 
which is going to be equal to the profit of product I. So for P sub S, P sub S would be $30 per ton. And of course, P sub F would be $40 per ton. We're going to declare Y sub I, which is going to represent uh, as a variable, will represent the amount of product I manufactured. We're going to declare X sub I J to be a variable representing the material J consumed per ton of product I. So you can think of X sub IJ as a, as a coefficient, representing again, how much of material J is consumed per ton of product I. So if we had X sub F1, we know that there is 0.4 tons of material one consumed per ton of fuel additive. So X sub F M1 would be 0.4. And M sub J is going to represent the material J available. So M, sub M1 would be 20 tons. So with that, we can now write our mathematical model. So we know that our profit is going to be the uh, profit of product I times the amount of product I we produce. And we're going to do that for each product we have. So in this case, it's only two products, F and S. So our, our profit will be P sub S times Y sub S plus P sub F times Y sub F. Our decision variables are going to be the amount of solvent base we produce and the amount of fuel additive we produce, or Y sub S and Y sub F. And our constraints are going to be on each of the materials, material one, two, and three. And we're gonna go ahead and write that out as X sub FM1 plus Y, or sorry, X sub FM1 times Y sub F plus X sub SM1 times Y sub S has to be less than or equal to M sub M1. So the amount of material one consumed per ton of F produced times the amount of F produced plus the amount of material one consumed per ton of S made times the amount of S made has to be less than or equal to 20 tons or M sub M1. And we write those material balances for material two and material three. And then we also include some non-negative production constraints. Um, basically on our decision variables y sub f and y sub f that says we can't unmake any product we make, can't unmix it, and we also can't make any negative product. So these two decision variables have a lower bound of zero. And down here is a depiction of this. Uh, when the problems are not overly complex, I always find a depiction really helps to sort of um, display or, or help to translate sometimes a business problem into a mathematical model. So here in this depiction, you can see we've got each of our raw materials being combined in various amounts to make either a solvent base or a fuel additive. So we've gone through the problem solving process. We took our problem description. We translated that to an opportunity statement. We gathered all the details uh, of our problem in the problem definition stage. And from all of that, we were able to build a mathematical model, which we're now ready to write and build within Python and Pulp. So step one is always going to be importing the necessary libraries that we need to solve any problem that we're going to be dealing with in Python. And for the most part, there's always going to be three libraries that we use. The first one is uh, Pandas, the second one is NumPy, and the third is Pulp. So Pandas is a great library for data manipulation, data management, um, data slicing. Basically, any time you're dealing with data, importing data, transforming data, Pandas is going to be your standard go-to uh, library. And, you know, it's pretty easy to bring in a library. You type import the library name. And then if it's a longer name and you don't want to keep typing Pandas, uh, you can put this as and shorten it up with an abbreviation. So in this case, I import pandas as PD, so I don't have to type pandas every time. And I do the same thing for NumPy. And NumPy is a great library for working really with numbers. Uh, we're working with arrays or matrices. It's got a lot of great functionality. And I import NumPy as NP. And even though we won't really be using NumPy much, um, it's always good to have, and you'll find that you use it more often as the problem gets more com complex. And then finally, we have pulp. Uh, which we are going to use again to construct our mathematical model uh, in, in terms of a linear program in Python.
so we, we bring in our libraries, shift enter again to run the cell. Um, and the next step now is to set some, some variable values. So I've named these variables to uh, correspond to our mathematical model up here and to the same sort of nomenclature that we use to declare these parameters and variables. So we know again, P sub S and P sub F are 30 and 40, M sub M1, M sub M2, M sub M3, 25 and 21. And then of course, each of the material consumption coefficients are listed here. Um, and just a side note, it's always a good habit as you, you know, go through your code, especially as it gets more complicated and it gets much longer to make sure you block and comment your code as much as possible. Um, it will not just help others who are either reading or using your code, but oftentimes it will help you if you end up taking a break from a project and have to come back to it a, a week or two or maybe more later. Uh, you can kind of pick up where you left off without having to do too much, um, too much detective work to figure out exactly what you were thinking. So we do, you know, brought in our data, declared um, these values and set them to our appropriate variables. So now we're ready to kind of get into the steps of building our model in Python. Um, and so when you're working with pulp in Python, the first step in generally speaking, and will often be the first step when you're uh, solving a problem with pulp is really to create a model object. And you, you do that simply by typing pulp.lp problem. And then there are two uh, types of inputs or two types of parameters that come with this LP problem object. The first is the name of the problem. So we're just gonna name it product um, for short, simple. And then it also wants to know the type of optimization problem. So we talked in episode one a little bit about how you can have a problem where you're trying to maximize profit or revenue, or maybe you're trying to minimize cost. And so here we wanna maximize profit where we care mostly about our revenue, our sales revenue. So this is a maximization problem. And so we indicate that with pulp.lp maximize. So again, step one, create a model object. Um, so we create the object, we name the object model, and then we create that by assigning it equal to pulp.lp problem with the name product and the problem type is maximization. Uh, step two is to create our decision variables. Um, and so we are going to create two decision variables. This, two decision variables that we specified up here, y sub s and y sub f. And in this instance to do that, we just simply create y sub f and we set that equal to pulp.lp variable. And there are three items within the lp variable class uh, that we need to specify for this, uh, for this solution in particular to work. The first is the name. So we're going to name it again, y sub f. Um, we need to set a lower bound on this variable, and we're going to set that equal to zero, again, to coincide with our non-negative production constraint. Um, we are not going to set an upper bound. There's, practically speaking, no upper bound. We know that we can make as much product as we have raw material available, so we have none for our upper bound. And we also, also tell the uh, pulp in, in the model what type of variable this is, and by that I mean uh, is this a continuous variable or potentially like an integer or a binary? Um, we'll get into integers and binaries later on this channel, but really a continuous variable is that basically any real number it can take on, you know, a whole number, it can take on a decimal, it could be one, it could be 1.37, it could be negative 5.4, et cetera. Um, so this is a continuous variable that can take on really any, any uh, non-imaginary value. Uh, and then we do the same thing for y sub s. Again, the amount of solvent base we're going to make, all the same sort of parameters. And just a side note before I, I go any further is um, when you're working within Jupyter Lab, one of the great features of Jupyter Lab is the contextual help. So if you are um, typing and you're using a specific library like Pulp, uh, you can, you know, just for an example, you could type Pulp dot and then if you hit tab it will bring up um, a lot of the different options that come with the pulp library you know different classes or methods or functions uh, you can see here we've got lp problem to create the model the, the model object and then if you find what you're looking for so we found our lp variable class if you do an open parentheses and hit shift tab it'll bring up more help so it'll tell you for this lp variable class 
related again to the pulp library. Uh, there's four inputs that it asks for, name, lower bound, upper bound, cat, and E. And it also shows you the default values. So if you don't specify these, it means they're not required to be specified. Um, but if you don't specify it, it gives us the default value listed here. So if we had just put the name in here of Y sub F, the defaults for lower and bound and upper bound would have been none and none. It would have assumed it's a continuous variable and it would have assigned the value of none to E. And then beyond this, if you want to understand what each of these specific these parameters are related to this class, you can come down here and oftentimes, but not always, it'll tell you more about these. So again, param name, it asks you, it tells you that this is the name of the variable used in the output.lp file, which we'll cover here in a second. So uh, Jupyter Labs got some great features in terms of that contextual help, so make sure that you use that. Um, let's see, step three. So we've uh, essentially created our decision variables. Now we're ready to create our objective function. So I create a um, object or a variable, if you will, called objective function or obj underscore function. Um, I give it a value of zero first, and then I start adding the terms to it. Um, so if you recall from our model, we've got two terms in our objective function. So we've got y sub f times p sub f, the amount of f we're making times the profit per ton of f. And then we do the same thing for y sub s times p sub s. Um, I broke them out, these two terms here, to be a little bit more explicit. But uh, you will see that in the future, uh, this pulp.lp sum, this lp sum is essentially acting like a sigma. So if we were to index this y and this p, which I will show in, in our video three series that we'll start next um, when we create some indices and some dictionaries, if we were to index this y and p, um, we could actually sum up terms over an index. And so that's how this LP sum would work. So um, not really doing much here because I'm being explicit, but you will see in future episodes um, why we use this dot LP sum. And then once I've created my objective function, I now can add it to my model object by going model plus equals objective function. And again, anytime you're adding a term or adding something to the model, it's gonna be this, this plus equals syntax. And I wanna pause here for one second because I also just remembered one item, which was the, um, I wanted to show the reference information, online reference information for the pulp library. So let me pause really, real quick here and get that pulled up. Okay, so I did uh, put this link in the description, so please bookmark this. Um, but this link here takes you to this pulp uh, library reference, which is really great. It's It's got a lot of just educational stuff in here. So some topics on optimization, which are definitely worth going through. Uh, in addition to this channel, it's got some good case studies um, and walkthroughs as well uh, that you can go uh, leverage as additional learning for Pulp and Python. Um, but really what's more important is you can search this um, search this website for all the different details on the, the Python, sorry, the Pulp library. So uh, for example, I search variable brings up Pulp classes. And you can see here a lot of the stuff we've already kind of covered LP problem, LP variable, we'll get to LP constraint. Um, but if you click on these different classes, it will bring in a lot of that same information that I just showed you in the contextual help. So um, good to have this bookmarked. Uh, you will definitely use it a lot uh, at the beginning. And as you get more fluent, um, you'll come here less and less, but it, it's a good resource to have bookmarked. Okay, so back to the problem. So we have, um, we have now done our model object, we've created our decision variables, we've added our objective function, and now we're ready to add our constraints. So you can see here the three material balance constraints that we covered in the mathematical model above. We have x sub fm1 times y sub f plus x sub sm1 times y sub s has to be less than or equal to m sub m1. So again, the amount of m one material one consumed per ton of F times the amount of F plus the amount of material one consumed per ton of S times the amount of S has to be less than or equal to the availability of material one. And we do that for material twos and material three. And the way that we add these to the models is again, model plus equals. We write out this left-hand side constraint. We put a comma here, sorry, the left-hand side constraint, the condition, and then the right-hand side value. 
This comma here can be followed by a string. Um, and this is how we name the constraint. If you don't name the constraint, it will get assigned some sort of arbitrary value. Um, so it's always good to name it, especially if you're going to be looking at the LP file here in a little bit. And it will make reading and deciphering your model much easier. So model plus equals, add your constraint term comma, add the constraint name, and then followed by another comma. We do that for all three constraints. And again, we don't have our non-negative production constraints here because we actually covered those in the lower bound when we created the decision variables. You could add them here. It would just be a duplicate, but you could add them if you wanted to, if you were trying to be thorough. Um, so then step five now is to write the model. So this is a really helpful step. I, I find the write LP really useful. Um, so I always write it, and then I like to go check this file, this LP. Dot. The way you do this is it's dot write LP and then the file name. And then I typically open it and make sure that this is a good, uh, correctly or accurately reflects what I intended to do. So we can see our objective function here, which is, looks correct. 40 times y sub f plus 30 times y sub s plus it seems to have correctly written each of our constraints here as well. Um, so this looks good. So this is a great way to, again, check your model. So we've written our LP, we've got it, the model ready to go. Now we're ready to solve the model, which is this last step here, step six. So to solve any pulp uh, model, you type model.solve. And then again, we can go shift tab and it will need two things. It will need the solver. So um, if you don't specify one, it will assume none which obviously won't do much for you. It might solve the problem, but it way, may, will not be, quote, necessarily truly optimized. So in our case for Pulp, um, and on this channel, we're going to be using CBC because it is open source and it is free. Um, there are other free sol uh, solvers, GPLK. Um, you can actually use the um, IBM, I think, Simplex um, solver too, but up to a certain amount of variables. I think it's a thousand and we'll run out of that pretty quickly when you get to some decent sized problems. So we pick our solver and then in, in that uh, for each solver, there's also some sort of some oftentimes some uh, parameters or options and with that come with that solver. In this case, I want to make sure that any messages that are generated by the solver, I want to keep those. Um, but I don't want to keep all the different files that it creates. Um, so I just said keep files equals false. And then once we've done this the model will solve and we can use now this pulp.lp status uh, with a inside these square brackets model.status we can use this term here to actually see what we got so if we run it we solve it we see optimal so optimal means that it found a solution that it maximized or minimized your objective function depending on the problem type if you get a uh, infeasible here uh, that's you know always a, a red flag, it means your problem didn't solve and it's because um, there is no feasible solution available. Um, so you either overly constrain the problem, um, so there's no solution space, um, or you made a, a fat finger typo somewhere, which is usually the, the case. Um, and we'll get into some solver options later, especially as problems get complex and, and take longer to solve. Um, but that's, that's the gist of building the model, solving the model. Um, and so next is evaluation and, and sensitivity analysis. So now that we've solved the model, let's go ahead and extract the information that we want from the solution. Um, so the first piece of information that we want to get is, I'm just curious what the objective value is. So to get the objective value from our solution, I type model.objective.value, open and close parentheses, we get 1600. And for those who have seen episode one, this is the same objective value we got when we solve this same problem in Excel uh, through a variety of ways. Um, and now what I wanna get out of the model is our decision variable values. So I wanna know how much product did our, uh, our solution end up saying we should make of our solvent base and fuel additive. So um, for a simple problem like this, this is a little overkill, but I'm just gonna go through what I did here because it'll become more useful when you have a lot of decision variables and a lot of constraints. So the first thing I'm gonna do is um, I'm finally gonna use pandas. I'm gonna create an empty data frame. So I'm gonna create a data frame name, df underscore bar. This is gonna be a data frame for my variables. 
equals to PD dot data frame open close parentheses so it's an empty empty data frame. I'm also going to create four empty lists. I'm going to create a, an empty list called LP underscore class so that I can um, label each of the records uh, with the type of class it's going to be. In this case, it'll be a variable class. Um, I'm going to have an empty list var for the variable name, an empty list val for the variable value, and an empty list RC, which will be the reduced cost associated with that variable. And then the way that I go get these, populate these lists with their information, as I say for J and model dot variables, open close parentheses. So I'm going to go loop through each variable in the model object. I'm going to assign the string var, bar, so short for variable, to the LP class, because that's what I'm looking at, it's just variables. Then I'm going to append j, which is the variable name, to the list var. I'm going to append j.var value to the val list, which is the value of the variable. And this is how you extract the value from a decision variable in pulp. You use a dot var value. And for the reduced cost, I will append j.dj. So dot dj will give you the reduced cost associated with that variable. And then once I've populated those lists, um, I insert them into the data frame. And this is an empty data frame. So the, the, it's very easy to create a new column by just like typing df underscore var, square brackets, and then you put the name of the column, in this case, I'm class. And then I assign the list to that column. And I do the same thing for name of the variable, value of the variable, and reduce cost. And then when I look at the data frame here, df underscore var, I see I have two records. So rows zero and one. And for the class, they're both variables. For the name, I have y sub f and y sub s. For the value, I made 25 tons of fuel additive and 20 tons of solvent base. And since I made, again, both of the something, a positive non-zero value of both of these decision variables, the reduced cost is zero. Again, remember the reduced cost only has a value if your decision variable is zero. And that reduced cost reflects the change in the objective function coefficient required to generate a non-zero positive value for that decision variable. So I'm going to do the same thing for the, the, the constraints. So I create an empty data frame for the constraints. I have four lists here. So I have the same list LP underscore class, which is going to be constraint class. I have uh, CONST const short for constraint. That's going to be the constraint name. I have LHS, which is going to represent the left-hand side value of the constraint. So again, coming back up here, that's going to represent this value here, the left-hand side value. The slack, a list empty uh, where I'll put the slack value. So again, this is going to be the difference between the right-hand side and the left-hand side. And since all of our constraints here are less than or equal to, slack is the appropriate term. If these were greater than or equal to, it would be surplus. And then DV uh, for the dual value, or again, what I'll use more often now going forward, the limit cost associated with that constraint. And again, you only will see a DV or a limit cost if the constraint is constraining the solution. So I loop through very similarly like I did for variables for J and model dot constraints dot items, open the close parentheses, so slightly different syntax than variables. And then I append constraint to the LP class list, J. And then I actually subscript this, this, uh, this constraint, I subscript it with zero. So this constraint in the model has really two subscripts, zero and one. So zero is actually going to be the left-hand side or the name of the constraint. And then when you subscript one, that really represents the constraint itself here, this actual constraint here. So I do J subscript zero to get the constraint name. To get the left-hand side, this is going to be confusing for folks who have, are new to Python programming, um, but it will get easier as we go. But essentially, uh, we will append to the left-hand side list. Um, we will append for each of the terms in a constraint. So for each of these terms, so here's the first term and here's the second term. We're going to go through each of those terms. We're going to take the variable value, we talked about var val before, times the coefficient for that variable. And we're going to sum all of that up for each of those items. So this is, again, 
not going to be obvious what's happening here, but it'll become more familiar as we do more problems. But essentially what it's doing is it's going for each of these constraints. It's looking at each of these, the variables in here, which are y sub f and y sub s, multiplying it times its coefficient value, right, to get the value of this term, and then it's adding all those together. So this, adding this term to this term, and if there were multiple terms, it would continue to go on. And it does that for each of the variables and coefficients and the J subscript one item. So the actual left-hand side, all the different terms in that left-hand side. For Slack, we just look at J subscript one, we type dot Slack, that gives us the Slack value for that constraint. And then the, for the dual value, or again, or limit cost, um, we look at J subscript one dot pi. Um, and then we append those to the list. And then similarly for variables, we create a column names, we assign those columns, the values of those lists. And when we run this, we get a data frame with three records for the three material balance constraints. The class here is constraint, the name, again, material balance one constraint, material balance two constraint, so on. The left-hand side value, so 24 and, 20, 24 and 21 represent the tons of material consumed in our solution, the slack, and the dual value. So we can see clearly for material two, we only consumed four tons. There was five tons of variable available, which gives a slack of one, and therefore there's no limit cost or dual value because it's not limiting our solution. For materials one and three, we consumed all of our available materials, 20 tons and 21 tons respectively. There's a zero slack for those two constraints. And the dual value or limit cost for material one is $33.33. So if we had an extra ton of material one, we could improve our objective function by $33.33. And if we had an extra ton of material three, we can improve our objective function by $44.44. So that concludes uh, our walkthrough and introduction to pulp and Python. So um, I encourage folks to get their Anaconda edition distribution installed, spin up a Jupyter notebook, and try to walk through coding this. Um, and just for beginners, one thing I will note is it is white space sensitive here. So it's tab delineated. So if you tab something, you know, for a for loop, you got to make sure you pay attention to those. But that's essentially it. Um, for episode three, I kind of alluded to it. We're going to be covering this problem again, but I will show a condensed mathematical model. So I won't write it out as explicitly as this. Um, and I will do that just for setting up what our episode three series is going to be about, which is taking this simple mixing problem and turning it into a production resourcing problem. So we'll take this simple problem and make it slightly more complex. Um, and it will make the mathematical model slightly more complex. And then throughout uh, multiple episode three videos, um, I'll introduce some new and, and fun concepts related to mathematical modeling and specifically to um, resourcing problems. So thanks everybody for tuning in and looking forward to seeing everybody during the next episode.